Oh, hi, Mitra. Right. Good to see you. And Very good to see you, too. And, and we will see you here in Nebraska live one of these days. I it's it's on my list. I was ready to come this year, but that's I OK. I, I, I will take it whenever we can do it. Fantastic. Well, uh, everybody, let me just tell you that Mitra is a veteran journalist, media executive, commentator, author of two books, and she's a change advocate who pushes for diversity and better newsroom management. Mitra launched Epicenter NYC, a newsletter to help New Yorkers get through the pandemic. And she co-founded URL Media, a network of black and brown owned media organizations that share content, distribution, and revenue. And Mitra, not everyone probably knows where you came from before you started these. If you would just fill us in a little bit on that before you get going, that would be great. Totally, totally. Um, and that's actually a part of our origin story. So Gary, can I pick up from you? Please do. Okay, good. Um, that's very much a part of our origin story. I um, worked at CNN for the last five years. Um, I did, as Gary mentioned, spend my career I got about 22 years um, at some brands you might have heard of. I worked at the Associated Press and Washington Post, Newsday, um, Wall Street Journal, um, and then some brands maybe you haven't heard of, but um, another theme of my career was launching new products within mainstream media outlets. So um, I launched a newspaper, a business newspaper in India called Mint. Um, it was a partnership with the Wall Street Journal and the Hindustan Times. I launched Quartz, which some of you may have heard of, a um, global economy um, website that was um, part of the Atlantic uh, when we launched, it's, it's no longer so. Um, and then um, something to look at besides my face, which um, I think is what we are going for uh, here. Um, and the title of this is somewhat provocative for a conference that's, uh, and you all can see this, you're good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, the title of this is somewhat provocative uh, for a mobile conference, right? Something that so clearly puts the power of, um, of technology literally in our hands. Um, and so it might be counterintuitive to say, actually, I'm gonna talk about non-digital things, but, um, but I okayed it with Gary. Um, so this, the title, which segues into the mission of Epicenter is if America isn't on Twitter, where are they? Um, Epicenter NYC's vaccine efforts and the power of not thinking digital first. And um, this kind of gets to our origin story. Um, I, in the uh, spring of 2020, like many of you uh, was, kind of reading reports of COVID, not fully understanding it. And then like a switch, your whole world changes, right? So the minute you decide to take this seriously, um, my world was no different. I had a few things that I think contributed to my ultimate decision to leave CNN. One of them is that my father had had a stroke a few weeks before we went into major lockdown mode. It was um, February of 2020. Um, and so this idea of kind of caring for elderly parents, it, he was going to be, he was in rehab. Um, and what do we do if we can't see him? He had a cognitive um, disability. So leaving him alone and being confused for large stretches of a time was not an option. I share that because I think media um, folks who kind of say, I worked at CNN and then I launched this and don't give you some of the humanity in between are kind of doing a disservice by not telling you the truth about the stuff of our lives that actually propels and informs our journalism. Um, and so while I had all these questions myself about if you were me, would you bust your dad out of a nursing home? Do you think I could take care of him at home? Or would you leave him in there? Because it's safe. like, those are the, those are the types of um, useful journalism I was looking for in March of 2020. And the irony, and I think many of you might sympathize with this, is that that's not really the type of journalism that was being delivered in March of 2020, right? Because, um, 
you know, again, I love CNN and no offense to outlets like CNN, but we're so designed to tell you what's happened as opposed to, you know, like one step forward, which I think the pandemic has forced all of us to do is what does this mean for me? But there's another piece of it, which is what's the action I take? What do I do with this information? And so I was definitely at a loss um, in my life, in my career. And I just felt like I have the biggest platform in literally the world, right? It doesn't get bigger than CNN. And yet um, I didn't know what to do. Um, it should not surprise you that if you're involved in your community, again, I hope this resonates with some of you, people start to ask you questions of how they can navigate their own lives. I live in Jackson Heights, which is a neighborhood in Queens, the borough of New York City. We are one of the most diverse places on earth. I think we're one of the best places to live on earth. That's why I live here. Um, but the same factors that make me love living here, it's diverse it's densely populated. So within five minutes, I could drop off my dry cleaning, get my computer fixed, get a haircut. Um, you know, all those factors contribute to uh, the perfect storm essentially for the spread of COVID. And so we were, as the New York Times called us, the epicenter of the epicenter. So while this stuff is going on with my dad, I'm getting, you know, my text messages, my mobile, so this relates to the conference, is blowing up with you know, my dad's at a nursing home too. What are you guys going to do? Hey, this guy needs a COVID test. There's none to be found. Do you know if they have yeast at the corner store? Um, hey, this guy unfortunately passed away at Elmhurst Hospital. He doesn't have any family in the US. He's undocumented. Somebody needs to call the city to figure out the process of claiming his body. Could you do that? Right. And as journalists, we're actually pretty good at navigating bureaucracy. And so what I found myself doing in between running coverage for the biggest website in the world, CNN, was answering these texts and phone calls and um, trying to find answers, but then also turning to the crowd, usually a group of people in my neighborhood of about 50 friends, right? Where I would just say, do any of you have the answer? Um, I also happen to oversee CNN's newsletter strategy, which is one of the biggest newsletters, also one of the biggest, um, you know, daily, it's the five things newsletter. And at some point, as I was toggling between like my day job and this community stuff, and then dealing with my father, I was like, gosh, like, what good am I as a neighbor if I don't use the skills of journalism to amplify these needs right now? And what good am I as a journalist if I'm not really listening to this acute need that is just like coming directly at me, right? Because my husband and I happen to be very involved in our neighborhood. And so we said, well, what's the, what's the best way to do this? Uh, because there's clearly a disconnect. It feels like the government, it, 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 in many ways, it felt like Jackson Heights really felt quite abandoned in those early days. Like, does anyone know how bad it is here? So my husband and I said, well, what could we do? And we said, well, we're going to, we're turning to email anyway. Why don't we launch an email newsletter? And so this is our origin story. Our first email newsletter went out on July 6th of 2020. And um, it led with the words, what's a New Yorker to do? And so that is kind of the uh, ethos with which we launched. Um, I feel this need to kind of give you the media landscape of what was going on as we launched, right? So there were discussions mostly on Twitter, but um, these are many of the stories behind them around um, can journalists be objective? Can we say Black Lives Matter? Uh, how involved can we be in our communities? Um, and so this was like going on in the backdrop of all of this. And of course, CNN was a part of these conversations around our own ethics policy. And, and of course, um, this was prompted by the death of George Floyd, but really it was decades, even centuries in the making. Um, you also had the, you know, what, what newsrooms like to call the diversity problem, right? Um, oh, you know, people now care about this issue and you turn around and, oh, wow, we built all white newsrooms and white leadership and, and what are we doing about that? 
Um, this is also coming against the backdrop of local news. Um, I, I don't need to tell you all the landscape, but uh, the economic factors, which had been very much the backdrop of my career, right? It feels like if any newsroom ever wanted to be acquired, they just had to hire me because within months of me arriving in the newsroom, it would be an announcement about Times Mirror is about to be acquired by Tribune when I worked at Newsday. You know, Rupert Murdoch is about to buy the Wall Street Journal when I worked at the Wall Street Journal. AT&T is about to buy CNN when I worked at CNN. And so I have lived this story, but, and, but mostly lived it on a national scale. What was happening in the local space, in many ways, that ownership structure made dealing with the day in, day out of what I'm describing impossible, right? For um, a chain to get to the question of like, is there yeast at the corner store? It, it, you know, the, the model of scale just does not enable us to answer that question as journalists. It might allow us as I did to turn to the crowd for some answers. So that's like another part of my thinking around um, the launch of Epicenter. And the last thing, as I already mentioned, is of course the, the pandemic and it's um, uh, just effect on Queens. Um, so this launched as a community endeavor. This was literally me going to CNN and saying, I'm just gonna do this thing on the side. Everyone's asking me for help anyway. Um, you guys good with it? We're good with it? Okay. A few weeks go by and um, it really takes off. And we find that businesses are coming to us and asking for help with PPP loans. Um, NYU approaches me and says, we have a group of students, we don't know what to do with them in the fall, um, but it sounds like you're doing some interesting stuff around community engagement. Would it help you if they came and you know, we, we sort of figured, and I thought, oh, am I taking interns on now? Like what's happening, right? This is like becoming a thing. At the same time, CNN approaches me and says, all right, what's your next few years here look like? And I um, called Jeff Zucker, who's the president of CNN, who I got very close to in my five years there. And I said, this is gonna sound crazy, but I don't think I want like more money, more power, more, 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 more at CNN. I think I wanna lean into less. Like I, <laughs> I think I wanna lean into feeling um, like I really am making a difference because and I, I feel sheep is confessing this to you because it's a bizarre conversation. Like when someone's offering you kind of the world and you're saying, you know, last week, my newsletter, we got six um, donations of diapers to the food pantry. And like, I kind of feel great about that. You know, like, I feel like that's the type of journalism I would like to try to be a part of. And so Jeff was like, I'm sad, but I get it. And I wish you all the luck. And I, he, he really has been a, a big supporter. Um, Pivoting to NYU, um, the students, we had we jumped on a call as I was leaving CNN and I said, well, what could you guys do? And they, um, they had this idea of doing a small business daisy chain. So they said, we'll go to the communities in real life. We'll see what they need and we'll kind of do what you've been doing and amplify this through the newsletter. And this was through the Studio 20 graduate program. And I share this because of your academic um, kind of home and setting in Nebraska. But, you know, I think that this marriage of, you know, IRL in real life, as we call it, and digital is, um, is pretty key to our success that we've always had connections on the ground, but then a desire to amplify. I almost call it like this new form of aggregation, if you will, right? And now some of you might be like, well, let's just go to fashion street reporting, except that we're not just telling you what's happening. We're telling you what might be needed and we're really trying to inspire some form of action. So for me, those six donations of diapers is the action and it's everything. Um, an interesting thing happened by the time we got to January of 2021. At this point in December, you all saw doctors were starting to get their vaccines, which felt like this mythical thing going on and eventually it would come to us. And then in January, Jackson Heights um, and this area of Queens is home 
to the largest concentration of restaurant workers um, across New York City. And as many of you know, uh, restaurant workers and taxi drivers were among the early groups to be able to qualify for the vaccine with the elderly and folks with comorbidities. Because of the work that those NYU students had done, I got some calls from those restaurants and businesses saying, uh, remember you tried to help us with like PPP loans and like tell people what we needed? Like, we don't know how to get vaccines. And so I said, oh, well, I just got them from my parents and I thought it was crazy. So yeah, I'm happy to help you. So it really just started out kind of similar to Epicenter's origins of just like, let me just band-aid this together for you. Here you go. And then the... Um, the front, the front manager of Jackson Diner, which is this like really well-known Indian restaurant in my neighborhood, said, my boyfriend's a taxi driver and he heard that you're helping us and he has like 12 friends. Do you think you could help them? And I said, yeah, I'm happy to do what we can do. And so began this, before I get to the effort piece of it, it was identifying what the community needs. And so I think a lot of us either launch products or stories with a belief of like, people need to know this thing. And if I think if you do it right, eventually the needs start to find you, right? So there is this um, almost like dance, right? Where people are just like coming to us. And so began our efforts with vaccines. Um, as of today, we've, vac we've helped get nearly 6,000 New Yorkers vaccinated and it snowballed. So it went from those small efforts to restaurants sending us spreadsheets, us starting out in Google spreadsheets and then graduating to Airtable. We at one point had 200 volunteers who signed up, which I'll get to in a moment. And so this idea of looking to the crowd for answers, not just became how we report, but actually became a part of our delivery of the journalism. And I share that at a mobile conference because the spoiler alert, as you've probably been hearing, is of course we need the internet for these efforts to find the folks who not just are not on Twitter, they might be on Twitter, but don't necessarily have the capacity um, in their jobs or their schedules or even connectivity to be as plugged in as national media has allowed to guide our news agenda. And so, um, these two things I share, one is our Airtable form of how people eventually found us. And I think this is significant because I think that the future of um, solving for both community journalism and very real issues of the digital divide and equity are actually rooted on you know, spreadsheets and um, software like Airtable, right? Like programs where somebody has access to them that then allow us to do intake to identify a community's needs and then respond. So on the left is Airtable. On the right is literally how our volunteers on this group of WhatsApp, we had about 50 or 60. So we had 200 or so on Slack. Um, and then like for kind of real time communication, we had a subset, we formed committees and we had a subset um, on WhatsApp, literally using our phones. And so another discovery during vaccine registration, but I think that's really um, kind of intuitive for um, you know, the world to come is that using your mobile with your laptop with another device started to become how people were working in order to help folks who were not digitally connected. Um, in some cases, we would have four volunteers booking at the same time in order for a couple to be booked in the same location because they might be disabled or have transportation issues or language barriers. And so if not going together meant that they wouldn't be vaccinated, we'd said, okay, let's try to get them to go together. Um, again, I cannot stress enough how much we became the eyes and ears of the internet and connectivity for the community turning to us for help. Another piece of kind of meeting people where they are was language skills. So we actually set up committees um, in Spanish and we had uh, Mandarin, Cantonese and a few other um, Asian languages. Um, and then we were finding that <clears throat> we were able to help people, but we were also starting by like February, March, 
starting to see people asking for um, kind of like, can we do it ourselves? Like, can you teach us how to fish? And so we had been doing these live streams and I'm a big fan of live streams now um, because I, I just, A, find them like in a time of rapidly changing um, news and content, like, you know, vaccine rollout was changing every day. Today it's 65, tomorrow it might be 55. I just found live streams like a way for us to react in real time to news um, and then be able to, through comments or through distribution, kind of continue to almost like tweak what we're seeing. We did um, a how to book your vaccine in Spanish. Um, and then we partnered with other organizations to get that out. So again, kind of this marriage of, um, you know, efforts on the internet with reaching people um, wherever they are. Um, Here's like an example of our other IRL efforts, which was we started to say, you know, we need to go out into the community um, because it was the spring, we were still sensing hesitation. Um, and also just to the point of like, if America's not on Twitter, there were so many people who were messaging us saying, is Pfizer, a three week or four week vaccination. And so there was like basic information where you might just say, Google it. And that's not the instinct of much of the population. And so we partnered with different groups. So one of them was a science uh, communication effort um, here in Jackson Heights, a bunch of public health folks, scientists who really wanted the science to be the conversation, um, but make it accessible. They also had translators. So we got them to our table. Um, we set up in Diversity Plaza across from a Wendy's. Um, the Rockaway Development Corporation came out. I think it was the New York Botanical Garden, like gave out seeds to people. So really not just saying, look, we just want you to get your vaccine, but kind of trying to structure things as a little bit more of um, community events. One of the um, discoveries we made in our search for translations, I was looking for a Tibetan and Nepali translator. And I found one and it was the woman who came to our table and was like, as passersby were there, she would translate and like be really animated. And then I saw her a few times kind of in selfie mode. And I said, oh, what are you doing? Like totally innocuous. And she was like, oh, I'm just going on Facebook live. Cause a lot of the people coming by see that I'm here and they're like want information on the vaccine. And so it also dawned on me that there was language and what you're consuming on Facebook. Now, many of us know this from all the bad stuff our uncles have been consuming on Facebook in regards to misinformation, but like kind of a, I had like a light bulb moment in seeing essentially almost a micro influencer in her community doing her work right before my eyes that leverages her power in a community that might not be getting CDC announcements or Anthony Fauci's press conferences, but are getting her. And then I enable that, I, I, I am able to um, leverage that relationship to enable th them to come to us. And so we've actually been doing that for other communities and trying to identify influencers um, throughout our vaccine efforts. Um, our volunteers, I mentioned them earlier, uh, including Ben Smith of the New York Times. Um, and um, I loved it because Ben Smith got like a doorman vaccinated and that doorman's family wouldn't leave him alone. Um, and I loved it because I would read Ben Smith like bringing down the latest media empire in his column on Sundays. And then we would be texting about the people he's helping. And so there was another element to this which made me rethink um, journalists, themselves and our relationships with our own communities, which, you know, it might sound like I had a great relationship with my community before, and I definitely did, but there are things I learned in this process that kind of peeled back the layers of my own naivete. And I think that many of the volunteers would say the same. On the right is an example of an email I've gotten over and over. Um, uh, somebody telling me that Epicenter was the most meaningful experience and sort of has led them to reassess their career. So there were two types of folks who volunteered. And I think this is something for us who are grappling with how do we get people to be a part of our journalism, right? What does community journalism look like? Um, one was the unemployed or underemployed, uh, partly because of the pandemic. There were people who 
you know, had been, you know, screenwriters in LA or New York and like had no work. And they were just like, yeah, this is something I could do on my laptop on my couch. There were the underemployed. I used to have more hours. I don't have that many anymore. Um, and then there was kind of a, a subset of that population of people who have jobs, day jobs, but were looking for more meaning in their work. And, um, you know, I've grappled with this idea of free labor for outlets like mine. Uh, we are now at a stage where we're paying folks uh, when we ask them to do things, but we have a decent model of volunteers who want to be more engaged in their community and just don't know how to do it. And folks who actually came to us as volunteers or underemployed folks who we are now able to pay. Um, that's really meaningful because it makes our role in the community, not just one of arming you with information, but actually uplifting you as a part of our process. Um, that's been remarkable to see. Um, I had the volunteers over the summer in our backyard. Um, they came over. This was just a subset of them, um, but just thought it was cute because, you know, when you usually have a party in New York or you're at like a journalist gathering, I'm sure many of you can identify the questions are usually like, what do you do? What do you cover? Um, where do you live? And so there's all these ways we're defined to each other. And I discovered in this process that like, we really didn't ask those questions of each other. And um, for the first time in my life, it felt like we were a part of something um, where all of those labels were almost secondary. There was like such purpose that people brought to their work for sure. Um, but I also felt liberated in terms of like, how do you meet people? And this gets to the journalism piece of what I think local news and community news is, how do we become the glue of our communities, right? And it sort of made me rethink um, even like, how we identify people as like 28 year old mother of two, you know, like we're very didactic in how we um, identify people, you know, rightfully so, but this just sort of made me rethink some of that. Um, our efforts have gotten narrower. So we are still working on vaccines, um, but we won a grant from New York City, um, a health fund that they run to go into under vaccinated zip codes. Um, and we were like, ah, we've been helping like, all of New York and some of their cousins in Pennsylvania and Kansas and Michigan and you know like we've been helping whoever needs it can we really go that narrow and it turns out going narrower has actually made us not just more useful but able to measure our difference um, so Queens Village is a section of Eastern Queens when we started our efforts it was 52 percent vaccinated and as you all know the magic number is 70 percent that you know kind of creates herd immunity um, we discovered that there were very few places to get vaccinated there. So sort of as is our style, we said, could we help you get there? And people were like, Ugh, I'm like working two jobs. I cannot get from here to Jamaica, Queens or Manhattan or whatever. And so we leveraged our other relationships and we got a van that goes there two days a week. Um, it's across from a park next to a church. It's not a heavily... Um, connected area in terms of transit. So one thing I think is important for this crowd is as we talk about news deserts, we have found that under vaccinated areas, vaccine deserts, if you will, also tend to be food deserts. There's only two grocery stores, for example, in this zip code, whereas like in my neighborhood, there's, you know, literally dozens, um, probably maybe even a hundred. I mean, it's, it's just so stark in terms of the food transit connectivity. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out, is information something that we um, offer alongside some of these other services that have like unveiled themselves? I'm super proud to say that as of today, um, Queens Village is 61% vaccinated. We're really getting close to that number of the magical 70. I can quantify how many people we have helped and I can see our numbers moving those percentages because when you're dealing with a zip code or a narrow population, kind of like the six diaper boxes I mentioned earlier, you can actually see the change that you're able to be a part of, which is just so remarkable for me. Um, so I am going to stop sharing, if that's okay, and hope that we can now chat. Um,
are there quite are there where would I see the questions Gary let's see uh if any questions uh they'll be in the breakout room and who's and we have a moderator who's uh uh, checking those and oh, I am I am Mitra I okay, got great. you back and oh. I should have said at the outset if any of this resonates with I, I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't I just talked for a million years and didn't say if anything resonates feel free to put that in the chat so also if you're having any um dilemmas in your own newsrooms if you have questions around ethics of this like we've been in a million sticky situations or if you're like Hey Mitra just bring it back to mobile please like I'm happy I'm happy to nerd out wherever you want me to I'm um, while we're waiting for some chat questions, just kind of a reminder for those who are here, um, you can please raise your hand um, and we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself to talk because Mitra is very interactive um, or we can do via the chat either way. But Mitra, where do you see, um, while we're waiting to collect things, where do you see kind of the future of your newsletter? I mean, this is yeah. pretty awesome work. Thank you. Um, so we've evolved into, um, like it's like a mini empire. I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but we have two newsletters now per week um, that are under Epicenter. We launched a school's newsletter because the pandemic parenting uh, was, God, that was something. And then we thought it was just going to be a pop-up. And as you all know, the questions around children's both vaccines, mental health, but also just like what have we lost in this last year are pretty constant. Mm -hmm. So that's a newsletter just to kind of like, it's, it's geared towards New York City parents. And then we run a newsletter that's admittedly bougie. So for all of the um, do-gooder I just talked about, we run a newsletter called The Escape Home, which is for second homeowners. That's $99 a year. Um, it has grown, it's, it's grown phenomenally. So I don't know what it's, I mean, I, I know this because I've looked at the numbers, but in the Midwest, the Midwest is actually one of the markets where second home ownership is growing um, fastest in the country. Um, lake houses, people who are like, I can live two hours from the city in a way I never could before. Um, and so we launched this newsletter, this is national, but God, if you, if you can't tell timing has been everything for us, we launched two weeks before Airbnb IPO'd. And so this convergence of travel, hospitality, and um, real estate has served us really well. And I'm also not ashamed to say that a bougie newsletter at $99 a year, and um, it's at theescapehome.com, um, if that can offset the work that I've just described, like I'm ready to launch 10 premium products, you know? So that is where I see us going in terms of a, we're a diversified uh, business model. Epicenter itself um, has three buckets. Uh, one is we got grants from the Ford Foundation and Borealis and the New York City grant that I just mentioned. Um, we, are, we are for profit. Um, we've worked with nonprofits in order to get, in the case of the city. I do think for some of this work, which is so clearly, um, you know, I always, I always hesitate to say charitable when I'm talking about our communities because I really don't want to see us as like some saviors or anything, but there are elements of this that are uh, very clearly in nonprofit mission territory. I think it's going to become incumbent for us to formulate a nonprofit arm, which I'm talking to lawyers about right now to do. Um, another area, we have advertising. So Epicenter um, has, for the last quarter, had um, advertising from McKinsey, which has been great. So we run some of their content around small businesses, diversity, um, you know, infrastructure, future of cities, climate change, like all of those Subjects are so on brand for um, for what we do every you know every week. The third, we just launched membership um, over the summer. It was really important for us that we don't have a paywall. So our membership program is rooted in three. We have three categories. One is five dollars a month. You get virtual yoga every week um, because we wanted to really keep the the volunteers taught me if you can't tell that like changed my whole attitude around the role of media in convening people so we do virtual yoga members can join and um it just felt again like very on brand like get together like get together with people and not have to talk about like how much you make every year and where you live like just get together and relax so we do yoga um, there's a middle tier, which is yoga and then donations to a food pantry through these like bags that we have that are insulated. So people have liked that just because they feel like they're giving, they're giving and getting, which is like a big part of our 
identity. The third is a, is an expensive category, $299 a year, but you get um, behind the scenes access to like museums. We just did a, um, the Catherine Graham exhibit in, at the New York Historical Society. The curator took us around and like talked about Catherine Graham in a way that like I've read the book, I worked at the Washington Post, I've never heard before and um, was a slice of New York City life because she, um, Truman Capote like did this ball for her. So there's all this stuff that I feel like we're offering that is rooted in people connecting, but also like experienced. Um, I, you know, like I'll do food tours of Jackson Heights. My husband will do art tours. Um, we have a hip hop tour coming in the Bronx. We have a tour of Little Caribbean in Brooklyn. So they're very on brand with our content. Um, so that's 299 a year. I have to confess, membership has been slow. We launched in the summer intentionally just to test this out. Um, what I'm really glad we didn't do is go right to a paywall because I like if you can hear, like we accessibility is like at the core of what we do. And so I just didn't want to block anything off. And we have a podcast and we're continuing with the live streams. I'm sorry, I should have um I should have uh told you the other things we're doing as well. No, this is, this is really helpful. I'm taking furious notes here. Um, and uh, thank you so much for answering that question. Actually, you hit on a few things I wanted to ask, but Gary, our illustrious host here has a question with his hand raised. Um, Take it away, Gary. Hey, I'm, I'm going to see if I can ask uh, a, a clear question because I, it, it's garbled in my mind. I'm trying to decide, are you creating a new form of professionalism and a new form of journalism with new goals? Or are you getting back to the journalism of the, you know, the 1780s where it was media and information were inextricably linked to democracy? Yeah. And, and it was yeah. linked because they were, journalism was a geographic community. That's what it covered. It, it covered one community, it united one community, it fed one community, engaged one community, but journalism, geography, and democracy were all linked together. I love that, Gary. I love that. Um, it also resonates. So I run another company, which I haven't talked about here because I didn't want to confuse you all, but um, URL Media, which is a network of black and brown um, outlets around the country, and Epicenter is a member of that. My co-founder, Sarah Lomax Reese, who runs a radio station in Philadelphia, it's like one of the few black talk radio independently owned stations in the country. She likens so much of this type of niche media to the Freedmen's Journal. Like as mm -hmm. black Americans became free, the media played such an important role in like, what does life look like right now? And like, she actually said one of the, when, when we, I was telling her about our vaccine efforts, she said, this reminds me the early um, uh, kind of post-Civil War journals were all about accessing healthcare mm -hmm. for black America. And like, this is so similar to helping people navigate like the basics of what do I have to do to stay alive right now, right? And there was something very, you know, first of all, I was like honored that she likened us to that because that's like, that's heavy. But also I think to your point, um, seeing ourselves as upholding the democracy is such a part of it because you could, if you're like me and you're going into these places and you're like, well, that's shitty government, you know, like you, you I mean, because it would be fair. It would be a fair assessment. On the other hand, there is the what can you do to connect the delivery of services that people can access, and that is an inf that is information, right? That's messaging, and so the only tweak to your definition I would offer is this thing is actually very on brand for your conference is that technology enables. I mean, technology enables us to bring down democracy as we've seen, but also. It enables us to put information and customize it to people in ways like never before. And I think one of the challenges we've had with legacy newsrooms trying to embrace digital is that we were trying to embrace like, and whenever we talk about formats and like I did, the, I am guilty of this at your conference that I spoke at, you know, which is like, we talk about formats and listicles and like, 
drill it down. We don't think about formats in, no, no, you actually need to have a Google Drive that has the letters that somebody can download in order mm -hmm. to get the service they need, right? Mm -hmm. You must be more useful. So the format we're talking is not, um, it's, it's almost a delivery as opposed to a journalistic like inverted pyramid being reformatted or something. It's literally, what is the delivery of that information? And I worry we haven't dwelled on that piece enough. I see a question in the chat and I, I, I know Pam will get to that. I'm just gonna follow up with one quick thing. Yeah. Um, and, and that is when I was in journalism school, I, I look back on it and I think that I was taught journalism as a means. Journalism is the process by which we get information out to the people. And our job stops then, once we got the information out to the people, we can shake our hands and, and say, you know, we've done it. Now what they do with that information is up to them. And that way we, we remain objective, we remain distanced, we remain fair. Um, yeah. We gather, we give it to them, they decide. I think you're changing the model to journalism is an end, not mm -hmm. a means, but an end. And that end includes engagement and then yeah. what, and helping people beyond seeing that our job of, as a journalist does not end once you publish the story, you're saying it continues so you can help people use that information. Yeah. yeah. Is that fair? That's right. I didn't think of it as the means in the end, but I, li I like the, um, I, I, I like that framework. I might borrow it. Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> you can say you heard it first at Mobile Me and You. I will. I will. <laughs> okay, Pam, I'll stand back. <laughs> no, thank you, Gary. All right. So from the chat, and thank you for those questions. We always hear that AR and VR are the future, but I'm always wondering if the oversaturation of technology we are experiences we are experiencing today will actually start a reversal to more impersonal community journalism that is actually relevant to people. Such a good question. So I think this is a real trend area to keep in touch with on the, like not even post pandemic, we're still in it. Um, you know, people joke about Zoom fatigue and virtual fatigue and all that. But what we found with our volunteers was it was very real that the desire for human connection was actually intense. And so, and also I would say that among many of the people we were helping, so remember the categories I mentioned with vaccines, one category that's reached out to us over and over since we helped them get vaccinated are elderly folks who just have a phone, but not really like on the internet all day. And in New York, there's more of them than I knew, right? And so um, I think thinking about, like, so one thing we've just thought about and I'm happy to share, because if anyone has ideas on how to do this, we run a podcast every week, like, should we call those elderly people of which we have a list of a few thousand and play the podcast for them by phone, right? Is that an example of connectivity that gives, I mean, you all know this, for, for that population, having something to look forward to every week is, it's like a world of difference and happiness, right? And so can we create like leveraging, you know, this isn't really at the AR VR level, but can we create in-person engagement that leverages technology is like what I keep coming back to because I don't know how to do this at scale without the technology. Um, like I said, we've set up tables, we do events, we're in Queens Village, like I'll be speaking at a church all morning on Sunday. Like I, I do a lot of that, but I'm still only hitting you know, in the dozens versus um, the impact that I think we can have through technology. Great, thank you. Um, next question, as a company that works with such a diverse population is founded by people of color, what are some of the challenges with maintaining that objectivity when it comes to black and brown issues in America? It's a really good question. Um, so I, you know, honestly, things have been so dire for black and brown communities during COVID that I, I kind of had this moment and, and Epicenter really was informed by this. Like 
what is the point of talking about diversity in our newsrooms if our people aren't even alive? And I, I mean that so fundamentally, right? That like we were talking about kind of, again, objectivity and um, what percentage of black journalists do you have on this team? And, and I, those, are, those are important, but this pandemic really decimated our communities in a way that if you're a, a you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a odd identity in terms, and this is why I live in Jackson Heights, because it's like the perfect place for me to live. I'm the daughter of Indian immigrants and I was raised in Puerto Rico. So I guess you could say I'm like really brown, right? Like I am, I am defining brown. Um, but we actually said, no, we will be black centered at Epicenter when we launch. And the reason we'll be black centered, which definitely proved um, out with our vaccine efforts is because when you solve for one population, and we found this with the vaccine efforts, you know, the wealthy woman on the Upper East Side benefited immensely from our efforts, right? Don't underestimate of the 9,000 New Yorkers who turned to us, we were able to help about 6,000 of them and another 3,000 just like got the vaccines on their own or decided not to do it or whatever. Like, but 9,000 people turned to us. A lot of them were wealthy New Yorkers who were like, I cannot make sense of this system, right? So by solving for um, black residents of New York and sort of like, what, how, what, how are we centering? I think is like one, thing to think about. Are we centering this population and does everybody else benefit? Because the story of my own family coming to this country is that black people fought for, in the civil rights movement, Immigration and Nationality Act allowed my father to show up here. That is 100% a result of those efforts, right? So there's like something akin to that that I try to infuse our um, journalism with. I think the idea of objectivity um, also comes up when we have our reporters out in the field and um, someone will say, well, are you on our side? Like, where do you fit in this? And, you know, we have a young reporter, she's, you know, in her twenties, we just hired her full-time last week, Andrea Pineda Salgado. And she says, I'm actually here to understand. Like I'm here to understand and we're trying to get people to act on what I discover, but that's like, and so she approaches it like very um, kind of similar to every other journalist in terms of the so-called objectivity that she's approaching a story with. Um, but she might emerge to Gary's point with something that tries to get you to an end. Now, would you say that's advocacy? I mean, I would argue that it's greater accountability than we've been seeing. So just as an example, I'm going to stay on vaccines because that's really what I talked about. So it's concrete for you as an example. Um, the government and the press repeated over and over saying your immigration status will not matter when it comes to getting a vaccine. We heard that over and over and over again, and it was repeated in media. I cannot tell you the number of phone calls I got. It was in the dozens of saying, I'm here, they're asking for my ID and my foreign passport won't do, or they're asking for my immigration status. So the way these things play out on the ground is often not what we, and I say we in the media are reporting or what the government is saying is true. And so I would kind of push us from the objectivity um, obsession into, well, actually by being closer to the ground, I am holding institutions more accountable than many very well-funded media outlets who've been set up entirely with the purpose of accountability are. So that's really, um, and actually, you know, again, it kind of also seems to go back to the shoe leather reporting a bit, mm -hmm. right? Because really rallying these communities to just call you and go, this isn't true and this is what we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really impressive. Um, do you have any last thoughts you want to share? I do have one more um, fun question for you. Any more questions from our audience today? Gary, anyone? Um, Mitra, any last comments, thoughts? Before no, we I would just welcome out? all of your thoughts on, like, I have to say one of the places I felt most supported has been the journalism community. Like people ask me about the objectivity and advocacy, but I always feel like that leads to better answers of how we're, 
not just defining journalism, but committing it together. So I really do welcome, you know, people staying in touch beyond this. I would also love to hear about other models um, mm -hmm. because so much of what I am seeing out there, like we've been, a, we've been, we've benefited immensely from. So do stay in touch. That's great. Thank you, you so your much. Final question. What, one question. <laughs> oh, do, yeah, you go for it, your, do you want to put your, um, uh, oh email. yeah, I can put my email in the yeah. chat. Hang on, because uh, I suspect you're going to get follow up questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, I I welcome that, and I also um, and I would just say like on the business model front, like one of the things I'm grateful we did is we launched with kind of almost unintentionally because we just kept running where there was opportunity. It's a diverse. It's clearly a diversified business model, right? And um, having worked in many companies where like one thing is what supports the whole company. Um, I just didn't want to go through that again. Now, will there be digital advertising to the extent we've gotten in a year? I don't know. I keep feeling like there has to be a shoe to drop given the economic devastation like that we've seen, but really not felt in the media. So I, I you know, I, I am trying to insulate. So anything on business models, economic models, I also welcome. And then the last thing I'll say is the, um, city funding piece for us has created a lot of questions. So anyone who has worked with municipalities or cities um, funds in the way that I just mentioned, they're giving us money to work on messaging. We see that as closer to the ground, but oddly we're also holding government accountable. So like, I, I am totally happy to talk about that because I'm probably gonna be the one with more questions, so. <laughs> No, that's great. I do want to make one last little comment too about how you've diversified your funding. Brant Houston, who's also a, a sponsor of this conference, talks about, a, a lot about that, um, especially through our nonprofit news network, that yeah. you have to diversify your funding. You can't just rely on one thing. So it's, it's certainly speaking to a choir on this end.